Hello everyone and thank you all so much for agreeing to be part of the panel and participating today. For those who may not know me, my name is Taylor and I'm going to be discussing my project titled Unraveling Health Insights, exploring the link between virtual engagement and real world well-being. As I look back on this remarkable journey, I'm filled with immense gratitude for the incredible opportunities and accomplishments I've had the privilege to experience and achieve. This journey spans across several years and has been nothing short of transformative. In 2021, I embarked on a teaching role at Victoria University. At the same time, I joined Varsity's Decora Research Project as a research assistant, focusing primarily on project management. Fast forward to 2023, I embraced the role of a supervisor for an honours project, while also taking on the responsibilities as an associate lecturer here at RMIT. This role has opened numerous doors and opportunities, ranging from curriculum creation to unit coordinating. On the research front, I'm delighted to share that I've published one first author paper with two currently under review. In addition, I've had the privilege to collaborate with national and international researchers on 13 papers. What's even more remarkable is that 80% of those papers have been published in Q1 journals, which is really just a privilege. I must admit that I could never have managed that my work would be published, but also garner citations. But to date, my work has been cited a remarkable 69 times with my papers cited 50% more frequently than the average paper in my field. And this is really, to me, is a testament to the impact of research I've had the privilege to conduct. And as I stand before you today, I'm excited to continue my growth in this profession with the goal of completing my PhD by the end of the year. It's worth noting that my PhD is by publication and I'm proud to share that all three papers are completed with the final step being the connections of these chapters, a task I'm committed to finishing by year end. Before we begin, let's just briefly discuss the presentation structure. First, I'll begin with the context in which the current project is analysing. I'll then introduce the project's aim and research questions. I'll then introduce each of the empirical studies, including the background method and results. Finally, I'll address the overall contribution and conclusion. Limitations will be noted and my timeline for completion will be shared. Today, we're going to dive into the dynamic world of digital media use and its impacts in our lives. It's a realm that has witnessed an explosive growth with a staggering 5 billion worldwide users engaging in various forms of digital media. But let's talk about the incredible potential and the dark side of this digital revolution. Digital media has transformed the way that we socialize, learn, work and shop. They have brought us advanced ways for improving our lives, from enhancing our socialization skills to promoting well-being through gamified educational tools referred to as serious games. But like a double-edged sword, excessive digital media use has been associated with detrimental outcomes and these adverse effects range from academic performance to the unfortunate passing of a 13-year-old boy who uh, suffered from gaming disorder. These alarming incidents shed light on the pressing need for resources and support in our country to tackle gaming disorder. Globally, approximately 4.6 of the population grapples with digital media use, prompting the need for diagnostic frameworks. Prompted by these figures and concerns, the APA uh, in 2013 recognised gaming disorder as a provisional disorder, while the World Health Organisation formalised gaming disorder as a diagnosis in 2018. Although these two esteemed organisations may differ in their specific diagnostic criteria or how they define that criteria, they share a common ground in their recommendations for the need to further research. Both entities strongly advocate and reinforce the need to advance the understanding of effective treatment strategies address assessment and measurement challenges, and further explore the risks and protective factors. So in accordance with the guidelines provided by the World Health Organization and the APA, it's imperative that we take a proactive step to thoroughly measure, assess, comprehend the underlying causes, and fully grasp the potential consequences of this condition. Concurrently, we must consider the demands for the industry and commitment and community, thriving to provide cost-effective solutions for both assessment and treatment that seamlessly intersect with the burning realm of virtual reality features and applications. Our overarching goal is to align with the recommendations of the APA and the World Health Organization by exploring the risks associated with digital media use, while at the same time delving into the potential benefits of utilizing virtual reality features for the assessment and cost reduction. So to address this, we consider the three outlined challenges to guide our research questions. Considering treatment, our first empirical study addresses the research question of how digital media is uh, associated with other comorbid disorders, and more importantly, how these insights can be harnessed to enhance the treatment of digital media addiction. 
Shifting our focus to the realm of criterion assessment, our second empirical study takes a comprehensive approach to crafting a measure for evaluating a risk factor associated with digital media addiction, the user avatar bond, thereby enriching future studies and insights. Lastly, as we strive to expand our knowledge and gain a deeper insight into the well-being risks related to digital media use, while also exploring cost-effective assessment methods for the user avatar bond, the UAB, our third empirical study explores the potential predictability of the connection between the user and their avatar, aiming to identify potential risk factors to well-being. So let's dive into the heart of research question one by first setting the stage by exploring the current landscape of digital media addiction literature. There is a consensus that digital media addiction has a complex ideology that involves the interaction between the user, their life constraints or life context, the user, the internet application of use or abuse, and in that line, a factor that has received high attention from scholars involves the concurrent psychopathology of users. The literature suggests a dynamic and bi-directional relationship between digital media addiction and psychopathology. On one hand, a person may grapple with a pre-existing condition and seek support in digital media use as a coping mechanism to alleviate their distress. On the other hand, a reverse narrative unfolds, where digital media addiction ignites psychopathological symptoms, for example, neglecting work or education responsibilities due to their excessive digital media usage. Regardless of who is correct or not, digital media addiction does occur with other psychopathologies. Therefore, appropriate treatment is mandated. Little attention has been devoted to the specific patterns of psychopathology for treatment seekers of digital media addiction. And this oversight is significant given the demand for services while also understanding how to best support those in treatment remains really limited. Therefore, our first empirical study attempts to address this area by assessing the comorbid psychopathological profiles and the interplay between these symptoms and the outcomes of digital media addictions. In doing so, we hope to illuminate a path towards more effective and tailored support for those in need. To unravel this complex issue, our research embark on a journey through an archival data set comprising 203 adolescent or sorry, adult gamers uh, clients from the hospital of Attica in Greece. With the methodologies to assess psychopathology, the symptom checklist was utilized to assess a range of psychiatric symptoms. To measure the impacts of psychopathological symptoms on the treatment, the study will use the therapy progress and outcome information provided. The, pre the treatment outcomes were categorized into three responses, either completed or continues, meaning that the client is still engaged in the treatment but was deemed not competent for completion or dropped out. For the statistical procedure, the present study employed latent class analysis, the concept of profiling addresses unobserved, categor unobserved categorical variables that cluster across individuals and identify subgroups within the broader population. And through this approach, it may generate significant implications for guiding assessment and individualized treatment with a more effective outcome. It's also really important to note that this analysis operates as a structural equation model, where a sequence of fit indices is required to be evaluated and the optimum fit is chosen. And lastly, to explore the association between the optimum number of profiles advocated by the LCA, the associated treatment outcome, a chi-square chi test, was performed. So what did we find? Well, interestingly, we found two psychopathological comorbid comorbidity profiles. Profile one was named high comorbidity. As we can see in this figure, this profile was consistently above the sample's average across all the psychopathological symptoms. For treatment outcomes, roughly 62% completed the treatment, while roughly 37% dropped out of the service. In contrast, profile 2 was termed low comorbidity. This profile had consistent patterns of being below the sample's average across all indicators. And consistent with previous research, lower symptom severity was associated with improved treatment outcomes, reflected by 70% of the low comorbidity profile completing this treatment, while only 23% dropped out. So what can we learn from this? Considering the proportions of profiles, uh, comorbidity seems to reflect the vast proportion of this population. Interestingly, the lower proportion of profiles, the low comorbidity, did not present with no comorbid symptoms, but rather presented with low severity. So this really illustrates support for the argument that digital media addiction should not be classified as an independent presentation, but rather the online presentation of a pre-existing psychopathology. 
Nevertheless, the existence of 34% of clients with relatively low symptom severity may also be seen as offering support to the opposite, that digital media addiction may indeed constitute a distinct symptom for a group of individuals. Integrating such arguments, the present findings may indeed be interpreted as inducing a fine line between these two schools of thoughts. Based on this, it's apparent that we do not exclusively have support for one argument or excluding the other. More advanced research is required. Additionally, based on the impacts of these symptoms on treatment effectiveness, we now know that there is a need for clinicians to not only focus on digital media addiction symptoms, but also address comorbid symptoms. And for clients with more severe symptoms, treatment modifications may be needed to enhance treatment effectiveness. To expand on the knowledge acquired from the study, we'll now take a deeper look into the etiology of digital media addiction. It's generally agreed that it's the interplay between the individual's characteristics of the user, alongside the features of the real and in-game context, that determines a range of positive or negative outcomes for digital media usage. Within that context of this interplay, the relationship attachment developed within gamers in their in-game character, referred to as their avatar, has repeatedly been acknowledged as an important yet under-research factor. More specifically, the user avatar bond has been described as an ongoing bi-directional relationship that has been suggested to contribute to disordered gaming use and possess a significant positive potential in gamified e-health applications. Therefore, to explore the potential benefits while also reducing the harm of digital media use, we'll explore the relationship between the user and their avatar. An avatar is a digital figure of representation of the user in the virtual world, which is customized considering appearance and or skills according to the owner's wishes. The bond between the user and their avatar has been shown to involve the following channels. First, identification, where the gamer fuses their identity and self-perceptions with that of their online representation. Second, the immersion channel, whereby the needs, the drives and the in-game priorities of the avatar dominates the thoughts and feelings of the gamer offline and are prioritised to the gamer's real-life needs. Third, the compensation idolization channel, whereby the gamer may counterbalance through their avatar real-life defects related to things like appearance and or character behaviour, like a confidence, for example, and to an extent represents their ideal self, who the user wants to be in the real world. It's not just the user, though, that affects the avatar by customization. It's also the avatar that may affect the user through this immersive channels, leading to the user thinking, feeling, and even behaving like the avatar in the offline space. And this is referred to as a Proteus effect. However, Problems can arise when there are significant discrepancies between the perceptions of one's online avatar and their offline self. For example, the extent to which one betrays their avatar more favorably or even differently compared to how they view themselves can flag problematic media usage and poor mental health, as users may be avoiding real life challenges via their avatar life. The explanation of such self avatar discrepancy risks is twofold. One may choose their avatar to reflect their ideal self, thereby compensating or negating undesirable qualities attributed to their real life self, or potentially, the avatar might provide a sense of freedom as one can behave in ways that would not allow them to do in reality due to the absence of real life constraints. And this is referred to as repression. Although such discrepancies or such differences may initially provide immediate gratification effects to the user, they may progressively perpetuate adverse well-being through over-engagement or, dis or disconnection from their offline obligations. So assessing the rate and understanding the themes of the user's user avatar discrepancy could be valuable for guiding problematic media use and mental health treatment when required. This knowledge could be particularly useful for the development of cost-effective gamified e-health applications, which findings suggest that the tendencies to even identify or embody or idolize one's avatar has been suggested to enhance the effectiveness of e-health applications and cyber education applications. Ironically, these same engaging qualities, embodiment and customization, has been proposed to contribute to disordered gaming patterns. So despite the numerous advancements uh, in instruments developed to assess the user avatar bond, there's not yet a standardized measure explicitly focusing on the self avatar discrepancy. So to fill this gap and address research question two, we examined archival data sets of 477 Czech adolescent gamers to inform a brief, valid and easy to use user avatar bond discrepancy scale. 
This scale contained a pool of 15 items. They were polar paired and rated on a seven point Mica scale. The items were descriptive and informed by differential semantics where higher values indicated less commonly desirable characteristics. So for example, when asked, I view myself as, one would equal strong and seven would equal weak. And this scale is composed of two identical subscales assessing how one views himself and their avatar. The creation of the polar terms for this measure was based on the O Goods and Colleagues theory of nature and measurement of meaning. In terms of interpretation, self-views items responses are subtracted from their corresponding avatar items with higher positive values indicating higher magnitude for self-positive views, while high negative values suggest better views of their avatar than themselves. Regarding the analysis to fulfill the study's aim, the participants were randomly split into two groups, one being the calibration group and the other being the validation group. Next, a sequence of EFAs were run to determine the latent factor structure and items were retained via the calibration sample. Following this, CFAs were ran uh, to confirm the EFA results via the validation sample. Lastly, an IRT analysis was run through the whole sample, which examined the psychrometric properties, properties of the optimum model at both the scale and item level. So the findings did reveal a unifactorial latent structure of the theorized user avatar discrepancy experience, and they're composed of eight items with social desirability, physical abilities, and emotionalities underpinning the participants' responses. And these findings reinforce uh, suggesting reinforce evidence suggesting that those portraying their avatars favorably them to themselves are likely to compensate for real life self perceived defects to experience gratification. Such interpretations may align with the identified digital media use motivations related to compensating for unmet real life needs and avoiding real life problems. Issues, interestingly, issues related to power preceded areas significance compared to aspects related to emotionality and appearance. Thus, it may be hypothesized that low perceived power and importance in relation to others are the real life defects, mostly informing the avatar's perceived superiority. These imply that novel mental health treatment approaches involving the user avatar bond may need to emphasize more on how the person's social positioning is experienced and also their self-centered cognitive processing and distortions. But overall, the eight items found to be informing mostly the user avatar bond discrepancy reported in this current sample relate more to the way an individual feels they're viewed by others rather than how they actually view themselves, thus implying that acceptance by others or social desirability could be the main drive for structuring an avatar, an avatar in a way that differs to the person in real life. To expand on the knowledge acquired from empirical study two and the existing literature on the user avatar bond, we can hypothesize that the user avatar bond may reflect health conditions of the user, similar to a phenotype. Indeed, such psychological qualities of the user avatar bond has been hypothesized to possibly provide information about the person offline, including the mental health conditions like depression. Where players may create an idolized avatar identity as a form of escapism or compensation from their depressive symptoms. Therefore, as players engage with the virtual world, their avatar could generate data which might provide insights into their behaviours, preferences and experiences. Hence, it's been suggested that the user avatar bond data translated into the assessment of depression risk could be regarded as a promising cyber phenotype pathway, which, to best of my knowledge, has not been explored previously. The potential of the avatars as a digital health marker within the cyber phenotype framework affords new possibilities for exploring and assessing mental health. Could this be a unique opportunity to promote easy, large scale and cost effective assessment via decoding the health information embedded within the virtual relationship, the user avatar bond? Could we train algorithms to give us automatically these responses? Well, to address this aim and the research question three, we longitudinally assessed over 500 adolescent and adult gamers across four waves every six months. For this project, I utilize wave one and wave two. In order to address this research question, we employed machine learning on RStudio, 
addressing the risk for depression as the outcome. The predictors included one's age, years of engaging with their avatar, their reported identification, immersion and compensation. We also emphasise predictors as being wave one and outcome as wave two. And based on these responses, participants were classified as either being at risk or not for depression. Considering our steps, as our data was imbalanced, we used synthetic minority oversampling technique, or SMOTI for short, to make classes close to equal, considering our outcome variable depression before training our algorithm. Following, we then split our sample into training and testing, the majority as training and the minority as testing. We then prepared the prediction recipe, defined the model and workflow with binary risk, depression risk at time point one as the outcome, while age, gaming, experience, avatar identification and immersion and compensation served as predictors. We then trained the data, or we'll trained the workflow, tuned the workflows that required tuning considering hyperparameters, and then finally we tested the workflow on the testing data. Finally, to investigate the pr prospective depression risk at the six month mark, this process was repeated with depression risk at tie point two as the outcome. So considering moderate depression at time point two, we had 274 participants being below the threshold and 19 participants were above the threshold. The findings suggested that idolization and compensation are the most predictable factors of depression risk, which indicates a really important aspect or uh, important relationship between the user avatar bond and mental health, which also supports that players may create uh, idolized avatar identities as a form of escapism or to compensate for psychological distress, which may indicate maladaptive coping or in turn eventually larger avatar self-discrepancy, likely linked to reduced well-being. The association between avatars, idolization, compensation and depression risk appears complex rather than unilateral. Not all players who customise their avatar in an idolised manner represents with maladaptive behaviours like depression and vice versa. Certain patterns like drastically enhancing their avatars compared to one's offline self may resent, represent dysfunctional compensation and therefore more depression proneness. Similarly, extensive uh, idolization with their avatar to avoid offline issues, including depression, may signify escapism and or perpetuating high depression. But in summary, the ability to predict depression risk from the UAB, the user avatar bond aspects, demonstrates the value of contextualizing this unique virtual relationship as a cyber phenotype. Just as a physical phenotype provides windows into health, the way users customize, relate, and interact with their virtual environments or identities offer quantifiable data, which provides information on psychological well-being. Okay, so now it's going to be discussing the overall contribution and conclusion. What's important to know is this research is far from a solitary pursuit. It's woven into a series of PhD projects undertaken by my dedicated team and me. Together we share a common goal, the quest to reduce or the quest to find a balance between reducing the harm of digital media use, but also amplifying the benefits. With that in mind, our study offers significant contributions across various critical dimensions, from treatment to criteria and assessment. First and foremost, these findings emphasize the multifaceted nature of effective digital media treatment. The identification of comorbid symptoms suggests that targeting interventions only by digital media addiction symptoms may not be appropriate. With the findings suggesting a more integrated treatment approach that incorporates comorbid symptoms is needed. Additionally, novel mental health treatment or, or gamified e-health applications like serious games entailing discrepancies between users and their avatar should encourage the social desirability characteristic when promoting health related behaviours as this behaviour or this area has been identified as the main drive for structuring an avatar in a way that differs from the person in real life context. Additionally, the user avatar bond, particularly compensation and idolization, should be included in the case formation for disordered gaming prevention and treatment. When it comes to criteria and assessment, our findings advocate for the implementation of personalized assessment protocols that can unveil individual specific markers, such as the severity of comorbid symptoms. This personalized approach not only enhances our understanding, but also paves a way for tailored interventions. Additionally, 
a validated user avatar bond discrepancy scale has been created. This measure can be very useful for e-health applications exploring self-discrepancies and health motivations. Such a measure would allow researchers to predict the effect of the avatar on behaviour more precisely. Notably, this research sheds, sheds light on the potential of the user avatar bond. As those who suffer from depression are often underdiagnosed, digital phenotypes offer an opportunity to remove barriers via mediated assessments of the user avatar bond. Lastly, when it comes to considering the broader community, the insights gleaned from this study carry really important implications. Gaming developers should be encouraged to prioritise the incorporation of authentic avatar design, employing harm minimising strategies and identifying personal barriers that may support healthy identity development in those with maladaptive avatar identification processes. In addition, it's important to encourage game developers, developers to integrate avatar metrics, for example, the UAB, the Use Avatar Bond, into digital screening tools. And this could also enable early detection of mental health issues like depression within gamers. In essence, this project or this research transcends boundaries, offering a holistic perspective on digital media related challenges and opportunities with implications that extend to treatment, assessment and the well-being of the broader community. The present project is not without its limitations. Our journey in this road endeavour has faced many roadblocks along the way and primarily uh, attributed to the unforeseen constraints of the COVID-19, which caused delays, and, and, caused delays and, and made us have to use our cable data. Additionally, a reliance on self-reported assessments, while valuable, does introduce certain limitations. We also need to be mindful of the extent to which our findings can be generalised. Considering the specific characteristics of our sample, notably the age range, the predominance of male participants and the particular cultural heritage that defined our three studies. And this also imposes limitations regarding the generalizability to likely broader and more diverse samples and populations. As we chart forward, there are several exciting avenues for further research that beacons. One of the key directions is the incorporation of behavioural metrics and also passive data collection, which may provide a more dynamic and objective dimension to our investigation. Expanding our scope to incorporate clinical samples, striving for a more balanced gender representation and engaging with culturally diverse populations will undoubtedly enrich the depth and of our future inquiries. Furthermore, the interdisciplinary nature of our work becomes all more evident. Collaboration at the intersect of communication, health and allied, allied health uh, holds immense promise, offering fresh insights and a broader perspective as we continue to navigate the evolving landscape of digital media research. The journey ahead is filled with exciting possibilities and we are eagerly anticipating the next steps in this ever evolutionary exploration. As I set my path ahead, I'm brimming with confidence that I will successfully meet the dooming deadline for the completion of my PhD by February 2024. With all three empirical studies neatly tucked under my belt, I'm excited to unveil the roadmap for this pivotal milestone through the upcoming year. At this junction, I've already uh, embarked on my first connecting chapter titled uh, Introducing Digital Media Use and Abuse. This will in turn set the stage for the introduction of empirical study one and underlying the need for this research. Moving forward to November, my focus will shift to crafting the second chapter, which delves into the intriguing realm of the user avatar bond. December will be de dedicated to chapter three, where the spotlight will shine on the user avatar bond as a digital phenotype. This chapter will illuminate the boundless possibilities and opportunities inherent in this concept, provide a robust foundation for the unveiling of the third and final empirical study. And finally, as we step into the fresh canvas of January and February, my energies will be challenged into crafting the concluding chapter. With these pages, I'll paint a vivid portrait of the project's finding, not shying away from acknowledging its limitations, casting a visionary gaze into the future with compelling directions for further research. And as I embark on this challenging journey, I'm supported by my dedicated research team and supervisors. At the same time, I, came, I am really committed to filling my role as an associate lecturer here at RMIT. During this period, I'll primarily focus on unit coordinating for four units spanning RMIT and on 
RMIT Online in, in Vietnam. These responsibilities are attended by other tasks that come my way. The roadhead seems really promising, both exciting and demanding. I'm wholeheartedly prepared to navigate it with unwavering determination and enthusiasm. For your reference, I provided my references for your review. Thank you all so much for your attention and time. I really appreciate it. I look forward to hearing your insights and in areas that might require a little bit more attention and any questions you might have. Thank you so much.